So kia ora koutou katoa, ko Siobhan Tongo Ingoa no Pleithorpes me Melbourne a Oku Te Puna Kene Te Noho Ko O Te Whanganui Atara. So that was my um, mihi, um, my introduction in Te Reo Māori, and I'm greeting you as a group. I've told you my name, Siobhan, and I've told you where my ancestors come from. That's Cleethorpes in the UK and also Melbourne in Australia. And I've explained where I live, that's Wellington, New Zealand. Now I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which I stand, the Kabi Kabi peoples, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to thank the conference organisers for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, I'm delighted because I very much appreciate the work you all do um, in and for citizen science. Now today I'm intending to take you through my citizen science journey. I'll explain how I started digitally volunteering for natural history institutions, how I progressed to writing Wikipedia articles, and how this has led to other institutions increasing the impact of my work. I'll explain how my engagement with the biodiversity community has led me to co-author scientific papers, create, help create biodiversity data standards, and to be invited on advisory boards. I'll conclude by highlighting just some of the projects that I'm currently working on. And my aim is to illustrate how my serendipitous scientific um, citizen science journey is proof that the passions of any citizen scientist can have a wider impact resulting in the generation of knowledge and also positive engagement with the scientific community. So um, I undertake most of my citizen science work on a computer sitting at a desk. And the reasons for this is that I was introduced to citizen science by the Smithsonian Transcription Centre. Um, this is a crowdsourcing website um, run by the Smithsonian Institution in America, and they asked the public to help transcribe um, handwritten historic documents into a machine-readable form because they wanted to add this content to the Smithsonian websites, to their catalogues, and also to make it findable and reusable by anyone. Now, when I first started transcribing for the Smithsonian, I found a project that was a match made in heaven for me because I met the long dead, but in my eyes, just fabulously wonderful, natural history professional, Vernon Orlando Bailey. And in the space of a rainy long weekend, I sat down and helped fully transcribe one of his field journals from 1906. Now, he was traveling in the Midwest of America studying wolves. And he didn't know it at the time, but this was when wolves were being wiped out. They were being hunted to the point of local extinction in most of the areas he was visiting. And I was immediately sucked in by his spare handwriting, his pen sketches, the surprise of an occasional photograph, or lyrical prose description of his surroundings. I mean, this long dead man became real to me, almost like a friend. Even now, I get this wave of affection for him whenever I talk about him. Um, so I kept trying describing his field journal because I was desperate to know what happened to him next. Now I wasn't thinking about the scientific impact of this work. I was transcribing because of the mental images Vernon invoked and enjoyed the challenge of transcribing his truly horrendous handwriting. I often begged him through time to sharpen the pencil or the nib of his pen so that it would make it easier for me to transcribe what he was writing. Transcribing his journals, he taught me so much. One of the things he taught me was how important field journals are to natural history. Now, I was transcribing lists of species names, descriptions of those species, their behaviour, descriptions of locations, and the biodiversity associated with those locations. His field notebooks were a historic record of the biodiversity at a particular place at a certain time. And I now know that researchers can use this knowledge to track changes in biodiversity at locations he visited, including changes in populations of endemic and invasive species. His field notebooks also contain detailed information about the specimens he collected, specimens that are still held at natural history institutions and continue to inform science. So by transcribing these field notebooks, the information contained in them can be matched to the actual specimens collected, enriching the data known about those specimens and ensuring scientists can then use that information to generate more knowledge for the benefit of us all. 
Now, field notebooks weren't the only things I was transcribing. Another of my favourite projects was transcribing bee specimen labels. Now, this project was by the United States National Museum of Natural History, and they were digitising all 45,000 bumblebee specimens. And it was part of a wider effort to attempt to stem the decline in pollinators. Now here I learned how important historic specimens are to science and also how some scientific collectors are just so prolific. One collector with a passion can impact biodiversity science for multiple decades, even after their death. For example, I came across the amazing Arthur Stelfox, a prolific collector of bee specimens from Ireland. His specimens and the data they contribute are used today to help protect bee species at risk of extinction in his home country. But as you can see, entomology labels on those specimens are tiny. They contain so little detail about the collecting event. So I begged the Smithsonian Archives to put Stelfox's handwritten field books into the transcription centre. And after transcription, researchers could then easily obtain detailed information on each of the specimens and improve the knowledge about those species and help efforts to protect them. Now, it was during this project that I started thinking, well, how do you, how's this linking going to happen? How, how do people do this? I even attempted to link some of Stelfox's specimens to the record of the collecting event in his field notebooks. But I attempted this via the very not-so-appropriate platform, the Smithsonian Learning Lab, which is actually for educators and kids to play around with. It was not appropriate. Um, but this desire to link specimens to their collector would drive other citizen science contributions I'd make in the future. Contributions on platforms like Wikipedia, Wikidata and Binomia. But I'll tell you more about those later in my presentation. Now, transcribing these bee labels also led me to learn more about other platforms and campaigns that empower citizen scientists to make similar transcription contributions. And the most influential to me was We Dig Bio. Now, We Dig Bio is a worldwide event to encourage the transcription of specimen labels and field notebooks. We Dig Bio events are held in April and October of each year, and people participate the world over. We Dig Bio events help raise my awareness of other transcription projects, as well as the platforms that support them. So platforms such as Zooniverse, with their Notes of Nature project, and also, of course, one of my personal favourites, the Atlas of Living Australia, which has Digivol. And during We Dig Bio, events are held to help inspire transcribers. So things like virtual behind the scenes tours or webinars with scientists describing how they actually use the transcribed data. And again, these emphasise to me what can be done when the data um, after this, with the data after those specimen labels and field notebooks are actually transcribed and put into a form that both scientists and computers can analyse. In fact, I became such a keen advocate of We Dig Bio um, I was telling everyone I know about it over social media platforms, everything. I, uh, I was such a keen advocate that I was eventually invited to join the We Dig Bio Advisory Board. But We Dig Bio campaigns also raised my awareness of the impact of copyright and reuse licenses used by institutions on specimen images and data sets. By exploring the different projects and platforms, I began to realise that not all citizen science or transcription projects are equal. Some are more generous with their reuse terms than others. I came to the realisation that if I was spending my precious volunteer time transcribing, I wanted the widest audience for my work with the largest ability to reuse my effort. I was not going to be spending my precious time doing this work only to find out it was going to be reused for limited purposes by certain researchers. So now I'm really careful to check that the projects I contribute to openly license both their data and their images, and I prioritise those projects that generously allow anyone to reuse their content. But back to the Transcription Centre, because there was one other really influential project that had a massive flow-on effect on my citizen science life. I helped transcribe this unassuming catalogue put together in the early 1900s by a botanist called Joseph Nelson Rose. He worked um, in the American Natural, uh, sorry, National Herbarium, 
and he created a catalogue of plant specimens donated to the herbarium, which listed both what was being sent to him, but more importantly to me, who was sending them. While transcribing this catalogue, I noticed that there were many names I was transcribing that were women. Women contributing to science in the early 1900s by collecting and sending in specimens. So many more women than I had expected to see. And I got curious about these women and couldn't resist researching them. And I'd tweet out my research and kept Megan Ferreter, the project manager of the Transcription Centre, up to date about what I was finding. Now, Megan started encouraging me to use my research and to start editing Wikipedia to create articles about these women. So with the encouragement and support at the folk of the Smithsonian, I gave editing Wikipedia a go. And here's an article I created um, in 2014 on the marvelous Rose E. Column. Now she was a prolific collector of specimens. She eventually became the first paid botanist of the Grand Canyon National Park. And that Rose E. Column article was one of my very first attempts at writing a Wikipedia page. Now, many of these women were unpaid, self-taught amateur scientists. Women today we would describe as citizen scientists. But they were making significant contributions to the biodiversity knowledge of their local area or state. And I helped create these articles about these citizen scientists because I am a great believer that if you see it, you can be it. I hope that these articles will encourage others to emulate these women and the work that they undertook. Now my citizen science work with the Transcription Centre also exposed me to the fabulous resource that is the Biodiversity Heritage Library. BHL is a consortium of natural history, botanical, research and national libraries all working together to digitise natural history literature held in their collections. And BHL makes all this literature freely available for open access and reuse. It is the most amazing resource. And Australia is extremely lucky because they have their own node of BHL managed by the amazing Nicole Carney. BHL Australia is hosted at Museums Victoria and is funded by the Atlas of Living Australia. It is a national project working to digitise Australia's biodiversity literature, making it openly accessible online on the BHL website. Now, as a result of the work of Nicole and her colleagues, Australia has one of, if not the most comprehensive online catalogue of biodiversity literature of any country in the world, all accessible and reusable by anyone with an internet connection. But my gateway to the amazingness that is BHL was via their Flickr feed. BHL was uploading thousands of images of scientific art to the Flickr website. And I found out through the Transcription Centre that BHL was asking for volunteers to place machine-readable taxonomic tags on those images. Now, these taxo tags help describe the images in a way that both humans and machines can read and, of course, help others find those images so they can reuse them. The pictures were just so glorious. The tagging was just so easy, and with that discovery, just a new obsession of mine was born. So I added taxo tags to these images, giving the name of the species found in the publication. And then I'd go away and research the current species name and add a tag for that too. And this is where my knowledge of binomials and synonyms honed while transcribing field notebooks really came to the fore. And while doing this tagging, I learned a lot about scientific literature, particularly the importance of the first description of a species, because I'd have to read through scientific papers in BHL to find the name of the species that had been illustrated. And I absorbed information about this taxonomic literature just by pure osmosis. This was also where I first learned about triples. Now, a semantic triple is a data structure comprising of subject, predicate, object, representing facts in a machine-readable form. The taxo tags placed on the BHL Flickr images are semantic triples, giving the taxonomic name of the species in that image. And this knowledge would help my introduction to Wikidata, another wiki project about which I'll speak later. I and others continue to add taxo tags to the BHL Flickr feed, 
and also BHL currently ingest these tags, adding um, this on a monthly basis. These tags are stored in BHL servers with the intention one day of actually making them searchable within the BHL portal itself. But adding these tags to Flickr has a wider impact because if an image is downloaded from Flickr, the tags can accompany that image. And because these BHL images are in the public domain, they have been added to Wikicommons. Now, Wikicommons is a media or image repository for Wikipedia. If you want to place an image in a Wikipedia article, it has to be added to Wikicommons first. So by adding these tags to Flickr, I've helped add descriptive data to images in Wikicommons. And again, this helps people find and reuse these images on that platform as well. I too use these tags to find particular species illustrations to add to Wikipedia species articles. Now, scientific illustrations can be really important. Sometimes these illustrations are the only openly licensed image available of a species. And in this particular example, um, so far, these are the only openly licensed images I can actually find of this moth. Scientific illustrations, that's it. But tagging these images with species names makes them findable and encourages reuse, not only in Wikicommons or in Flickr, but also in other publications. So just for one example, a few years ago, I visited a local school and saw the Department of Conservation had a stall there. They were handing out a pamphlet, encouraging locals to consider what they could do to improve the water quality of their local streams and rivers. And on that platform was this beautiful public domain illustration of a New Zealand endemic freshwater fish, an image I am convinced that they found either via Flickr or Wikicommons, because I had tagged this image in Flickr, I had added it to Wikicommons, and I'd placed it on the Wikipedia article for this species. Now, transcribing field notebooks had another flow on effect in my life because I was inspired to emulate those authors of those field notebooks. I too wanted to make observations of biodiversity, so I joined iNaturalist. And in doing so, again, I was thinking about the impact of the citizen science work. I wanted my observations and their data to be used by scientists, and so I chose the iNaturalist platform because I knew that once an iNaturalist observation reaches research grade, then that data is aggregated eventually into the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, also known as GBIF. And this aggregation helps enrich our biodiversity knowledge and helps that data become more easily accessible and reusable by researchers. But I didn't just stop there because I always aim to extend the impact of my and other iNaturalist user observations. Once my observation has reached research grade in iNaturalist, and assuming the observation has been identified by experts I trust, and also, very importantly for me, the image is of good quality, I then upload that image from iNaturalist into Wikicommons for reuse on Wikipedia pages. And here's an example of a Wikipedia article I've done this for. That's my image in iNaturalist, my image in Wikicommons, and my image on the lead box in that Wikipedia article. Now to do this, to add these observations into Wikicommons, the images in iNaturalist have to be openly licensed for reuse. But the default license in iNaturalist is currently a Creative Commons attribution non-commercial use license. This is a closed license. It is not compatible with Wikicommons. So in order to share my images directly from iNaturalist to Wikicommons, I had to change my reuse license in iNaturalist itself. And I would encourage all iNaturalist users to consider doing this. And I can feel this question sort of circulating above your heads, how do I do this? Well, I'd be delighted to explain. First, I don't think you can do it via the app. So the method I'm going to show you is when you log into your account on a web server. Mm -hmm. 
So you go to your account image or photo icon at the top right of your account and you click the drop down menu and then you click account settings and then you go to content and display tab for your account and click on that. Scroll right down to the bottom. There are three types of content you can license for reuse. I've set all mine to CC0. That is the content I generate and upload to iNaturalist is dedicated to the public domain for anyone to reuse for anything. iNaturalist lets you know which license is compatible for reuse on what platforms. So personally, I'd recommend choosing, like me, either CC0 or CC, um, CC BY, which is Creative Commons Attribution Reuse License, basically because both these licenses allow reuse of your content in both GBIF, Atlas of Living Australia, and also Wikipedia. And if you want to change the reuse license on your existing contributions, make sure you tick each of the boxes at the bottom. And please, once you've changed your default license, Press save. Now sharing is caring, and the more open you set your reuse licenses, the wider the audience will be for reusing your contributions. Now I recognise there are going to be cases where people may not want to change the default licence. For example, some iNaturalist users are professional photographers, and obviously want to make a living from their images but still want to ensure scientists can benefit from their observations. So for those folk, just leave the license as it is. But I'll encourage those who don't make a living from their images to consider changing the iNaturalist default license. Now using iNaturalist has taught me a lot about species, but it has also taught me how many species lack a Wikipedia page. And this is because when I observe a species, I try and learn more about it. And my go-to resource, because I'm a Wikipedian, is Wikipedia. But often the Wikipedia page, if it exists at all, is very brief. And of course, I want to play my part in improving this. At the same time I was becoming aware of these gaps in Wikipedia, I also discovered beautiful, openly licensed specimen images of Manaki Whenua Land Care Research, that's a New Zealand government-owned research institution. I was particularly attracted to their moth images, and because Manaki Whenua uses an open Creative Commons attribution reuse license, I could upload all of them into Wikicommons for reuse on Wikipedia. So these glorious images also motivated me to write more species articles in Wikipedia. Now, I do admit to feeling very sorry for Australia. Unfortunately, it appears your CSIRO is not generous with its reuse terms for its images, including its most stunningly gorgeous moth images. As you can see, these are the reuse terms um, of images on the new CSIRO Australia Moths website. These copyright terms that mean all those images can't be reused in Wikipedia, which I regard as a real shame. Poor Australia. <laughs> However, because our New Zealand equivalent, Lanka Research, is generous, I could add all our images to Wikicommons, and then I create and enrich Wikipedia articles about each of these moth species, including reusing using those images in those articles. Now, this is a project of mine is still a work in progr progress because we've got 2,000 moth species, and I am nowhere near complete. But once an article is written, it helps everyone have access to information about these species. And the Wikipedia articles I create and enrich include a description of the species, information on taxonomy, information on its life cycle, hosts and parasites, and its conservation status, at a bare minimum. So when writing a Wikipedia article, I make use of information about species found in the Biodiversity Heritage Library, and I am particularly keen to make sure that the first description of those moth species is just a click away for anyone who needs to access it. And that includes scientists researching these species. They don't have to fossick through BHL. They can just go to Wikipedia, go to the taxonomy section, and click on the reference, and it will automatically take them where they need to go very, very quick. So I cite this original description, normally found in BHL, in the taxonomy section of the article. 
I'm also keen to emphasise whether the species is at risk of extinction, because it seems obvious to me that if the conservation status is added to an article, it helps raise awareness of the general public. But I also want to draw attention to those species that are data deficient. I believe educating everyone about what isn't known about a species can help guide those attempting to fill those knowledge gaps. And I include citizen scientists here because those knowledge gaps can include such information as the life cycle of the moth, the range of the species, the fact that the adult male or female or larvae have yet to be observed, and citizen scientists, of course, can help discover this type of information about data deficient species. I'm also really concerned about the general decline in insect populations, so I add information on larval host species. And I see this as a way to help inspire folk to plant those host species, thus encouraging these moths to be present in their gardens and local reserves. So by writing these Wikipedia articles, I aim to raise the awareness of the public about the species, encourage citizen scientists to enrich information known about those species, and to assist in conservation efforts to preserve the species. But another benefit of writing these Wikipedia articles is their reuse. Wikipedia is openly licensed for reuse under Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike Reuse License. So anyone can reuse a Wikipedia article text so long as they attribute the content to Wikipedia and license its reuse under the same license. This open license is one of the many reasons why Wikipedia is one of the most popular websites in the world. Its content can and is reused everywhere. So for example, internet search engines such as Google reuse Wikipedia content and also place Wikipedia articles really high in their search results. And I wonder whether folk really understand the practical effect of this. I can write a Wikipedia article that contains images, references books, journals, magazines, newspapers, and it is that article that is one of the top results on a Google search on that topic. It is a powerful position to be in, to write content that is one of the first, if not the very first thing that people see when searching on that topic. But it is not just the internet search engines that reuse Wikipedia articles. The Atlas of Living Australia makes use of Wikipedia article content. So if you improve a Wikipedia, uh, sorry, an Australian species article in Wikipedia, you will automatically be improving the Atlas of Living Australia. iNaturalist also uses Wikipedia content iNaturalist uses Wikipedia articles in their About section on their species pages. And here what you see here is an About section on an iNaturalist species page. This is what it looks like with no Wikipedia article. This is the same species page after it's had a Wikipedia article written by, about the species. And it's been subsequently ingested. Sometimes the ingestions can take like a week, but you know, I can wait a week for my stuff to be reused. So the ingestion of this Wikipedia article into iNaturalist can help citizen scientists to accurately identify the species that they're observing. It in turn enriches what's known about that species. And because iNaturalist observation data is in turn ingested into GBIF, it provides more data to scientists researching that species. And so the availability of more accurate observation data can help generate scholarly articles, which then are used to enrich the Wikipedia article. So you can see why I think of ed editing Wikipedia as part of this virtuous cycle of enrichment of biodiversity knowledge. Now the photos on these iNaturalist species pages can also be manually curated by iNaturalist users. And this curation helps ensure that the best photos representing the species are seen by iNaturalist folk when they're comparing their observations to the species page. But what if a species hasn't been observed in iNaturalist? In such cases, there'll be no images on a species page. And if that's the case, how are citizen scientists going to work out whether they've actually observed the species or not? They've got nothing to compare it to. So to help fill this gap, I find openly licensed, expertly identified specimen images from natural history institutions. 
and then I upload them to WikiCommons. And then I can manually curate iNaturalist species pages, adding those images from WikiCommons to the iNaturalist species page so that citizen scientists have something to compare their observations to. And if I can't find specimen images, I'll try and find some openly licensed scientific illustrations of particular species. And I do this so that citizen scientists have at least some idea about what the species looks like because something is better than nothing. And as I've explained previously, iNaturalist observation images themselves, if openly licensed and at research grade, can be ingested into WikiCommons for reuse in Wikipedia. Again, it's providing this another virtuous cycle of reuse and enrichment. And as a result of this work, I've been privileged enough to be invited onto the advisory board of iNaturalist Aotearoa New Zealand. Now another um, project that I've been involved in, I had an opportunity to put all these wiki skills and iNaturalist skills into practice at a BioBlitz. So I and another editor called Mike Dickerson, we helped wikify a BioBlitz held at the Wellington Botanic Gardens. And we spent the day creating and expanding Wikipedia articles about species observed there and adding images from the BioBlitz iNaturalist project once they reached research grade, which wasn't hard because we had a whole load of scientists there doing that work, into Wikipedia. Another project I've helped with is called Critter of the Week. Now, Critter of the Week is a program on Radio New Zealand. It stars Nicola Toki of Forest and Bird and the radio host Jesse Mulligan, and they talk about New Zealand species both endangered and neglected. And each week's broadcast is supported by a team of Wikipedians. We get advance notice of the subject of the broadcast so that we can improve the Wikipedia article for that species in anticipation of that show. Because you know, if someone's listening about a species, what's the first thing you're gonna do? They're gonna Google it. What's the first search result on Google? The Wikipedia page. So we'd better be prepared. And my wiki editing and outreach contributions have helped inspire others to replicate this type of work. This is an example of Heidi Mug, a botanical curator at Te Papa, our national museum. She was keen to write Wikipedia articles on New Zealand native forget-me-nots. And I spent time helping Heidi um, improve her editing skills. And since then, she has been off and running. She has um, basically spent a lot of time writing and enriching Wikipedia articles on New Zealand endemic species for the benefit of us all. And her work has in turn inspired to Papa's spider expert, Phil Servant, who's now contributing his expertise to Wikipedia. Now, researching these Wikipedia articles has other flow-on effects. One important one is that it can highlight issues, issues with taxonomy. So I've discovered that some species are known in New Zealand by a scientific name that differs from the scientific name they're known by in GBIF. Basically, synonyms, GBIF being slow to update on um, improvements in taxonomy and naming and descriptions. But this can be a really serious issue because the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF, is where natural history institutions the world over, as well as citizen science websites such as iNaturalist, place their data. And if those institutions, in those institutions, the species is known by a name that differs from the name in GBIF, GBIF can't aggregate that data. And if that data can't be aggregated, it isn't available for researchers or policy folk to use. So me being me, when I come across such issues, I want to fix them. And I've been lucky enough to be taught how. Behind GBIF lurks the Catalogue of Life database. And the Catalogue of Life attempts to list all the species of the world. So if you want to correct the taxonomy in GBIF, you have to correct the Catalogue of Life first. Now the Catalogue of Life is a database worked on by multitudes of taxonomists. But these taxonomists realise that the database can always be improved. So the Catalogue of Life has a GitHub repository where taxonomic issues can be flagged by anyone. So if I come across a GBIF taxonomic problem while writing a Wikipedia article, I raise a GitHub issue with the Catalogue of Life. I then cite all my sources, and the issue will be checked by an expert taxonomist. And if they agree, they'll edit the Catalogue of Life. This flows through to GBIF, 
which results in natural history specimen data being better aggregated. Now, as I've explained previously, as well as working on species, I also work on people who generate biodiversity data. I spend a lot of time not just writing Wikipedia articles, but adding data to Wikidata about taxonomists, collectors of specimens, authors of scientific papers. And I do this because I want to make sure that the biodiversity folk get credit, the credit they deserve for the important work that they do. Now, as a New Zealander, I'm obliged to work some sort of reference to the Lord of the Rings in any presentation. And this is it. Of all the projects I contribute to, the one project to rule them all is Wikidata. Wikidata is like a, well, it is. It's a sister project to Wikipedia. It is free, open, multilingual knowledge base that can be read and edited by both humans and machines. Think of Wikidata as containing linked, open data on pretty much everything. It is huge. It's like this web of interlinked knowledge. Now, statements are added to Wikidata in a semantic triple format, the same sort of format as the taxo tags I was adding to the BHL Flickr feed, subject, predicate, object. And Wikidata contains millions of these data statements. It also links to other databases, so it acts like this database hub. And all this data is openly licensed, freely reusable, can be queried by anyone, and also visualised, enabling folk to answer questions that would otherwise be really difficult to answer. So I dare add information on biodiversity people to Wikidata because knowing who does the biodiversity work is important. It can help improve the data relating to the species. It helps link information, such as the first description of the species, who collected the holotype specimen, field notebooks describing the collection of specimens, and scientific publications adding to our species knowledge. It also helps, as I've said, give greater recognition to the person actually doing the work. Because once those people are in Wikidata, I can then use their Wikidata item, the number that represents them, to link them to their contributions. And the main website I re reuse Wikidata items in is called Binomia. Now this is a website that connects people who collect or identify specimens to the actual specimens themselves. Binomia takes the names of collectors on, say, um, specimen labels or the little B labels or whatever labels they've got, the data generated from those labels, and it's given in GBIF, collects those names, and then suggests a list of specimens that may have been collected by that person. And Binomia then asks volunteers like me to confirm whether that attribution is accurate or not. So we link specimens to the collector via the collector's orchid identifier if they're a living or their Wikidata item if they're deceased. We answer the question, did this particular person, represented by their Wikidata item or ORCID ID, collect or identify this particular specimen as listed in GBIF? Now the whole purpose of this work is to give collectors credit for their collecting. By digitally linking the collector, Binomia helps show the impact, not just of professional scientists, but also citizen scientists who've contributed to biodiversity knowledge by adding the collecting specimens and adding them to natural history institutions who then put that data into GBIF. And because Binomia aggregates the attribution data and generates a profile for the collector, it helps provide even more information about those collectors, including where they collected, what they specialised in collecting, and who they collected with. And this attribution work can have important flow-on effects in improving the data known about the species collected, including, um, and, and as an illustration of this, I actually want to talk about the Bat Collectors project I was involved in. So this project was part of a much larger effort to digitise bat specimens the world over after it was discovered that bats were a likely vector for the COVID-19 virus. There was a worldwide effort to digitise bat specimens and make that data available to researchers through GBIF. 
as part of this digitisation effort, it was a push to digitally link the bat specimens to their collectors via binomia. Now, this project acknowledged the importance of knowing who the collector is because it helps enrich information on the collecting event and also helps link the specimens to other documents, things like field notebooks, scientific publications. This linking can lead to improvements of location or collection data, which in turn can assist the study of these species as a carrier of the COVID-19 virus. Now, as part of my contribution, it was very small. I helped with a workshop training multiple natural history folk on how to create Wikidata items for deceased collectors, and then how to add that Wikidata um, QID number for them into Binomia so that those specimens could then be linked to that collector. So this is just one example of my outreach efforts with the wider biodiversity community. And these outreach efforts um, have led me to be invited by, um, it led to invitations basically, to contribute to other research efforts. Um, for example, I was invited to co-author pa a paper about the disambiguation of people's names in biological collections. Basically, how to work out who's who. This paper gave prep best practice guidelines to natural history institutions the world over on how to create and use identifiers for people and also how to disambiguate those people contributing to biodiversity data so that one John Smith is different from another John Smith. And my participation in that scientific paper also had flow-on effects and for my current projects because I got to know my co-authors. So I got an invitation to contribute to a project researching the women after flowering plant genera have been named. So this was a project researching the women honoured, and we've just submitted a um, paper for publication on this topic. In fact, one of the women, Clara Wilde, is a sister of Ferdinand von Müller that we talked about yesterday um, afternoon. So she's got a genus named after her. I'm also part of an international collaboration working on how to model data about research expeditions. Now our group is working on an agreed schema which we'll be using to model research expeditions in Wikidata. And once we've finalised this, we hope to produce a best practice documentation that will encourage institutions the world over to share their data on research expeditions. And then we'll use Wikidata to link those expeditions to their participants, to the research generated, and to the institutions that hold specimens sourced from those research expeditions. Finally, I'm also currently collaborating with some educators in America. We're creating an undergraduate course on hidden figures in natural history collections. This course, the course modules will teach undergraduates how to research collectors in natural history institution collections, and then how to add those collectors to Wikidata and then Binomia. And the aim is to highlight the work done by previously overlooked contributors to biodiversity knowledge. Now I recognise my presentation is coming to a close. So in conclusion, I'd like to share with you three general lessons that I've learned during my citizen science journey. First, follow your enthusiasms. Deep dive into whatever you're passionate about. Learn as much as you can and then share that knowledge. Think strategically about how you can maximise the impact of your work. Share it widely, openly, generously. Now, I'm, where I'm, I'm likely preaching to the converted here because I've seen so much of this already happening at this conference. Second is to find your people. It is fun and motivating to do citizen science with a group of people you love to hang out with. Talk to folk, both in person and online. Share your enthusiasm for their work and yours. There are like-minded people the world over. You just have to be brave enough to reach out and connect with them. And again, I think everyone here has already discovered this because you're here at this amazing conference sharing what you do with your fellow enthusiasts. And lastly, be bold and just say yes. My citizen science journey has taught me to be brave, to say yes to opportunities where, even when I know this will place me well outside my comfort zone. By saying yes, I've had the most amazing experiences and had opportunities to undertake interesting volunteer work and meet um, just wonderful people. Again, just like at this conference. So thank you. Thank you to particularly the um, organisers inviting me to speak. <laughs>